welcome again, everybody, um, for our almost last session for this uh, conference uh, for this time. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, the chair of this particular session, Andrew Weber, who is the Vice Master of Churchill College. Um, he's been very busy these last two years with COVID especially, um, but he's also a distinguished uh, German study person. Uh, he's got an interest into an Australian, Australian person who actually wrote diaries, would you call them diaries, <laughs> for a long time. So Andrew has finished editing the journals or is in the process of editing his journals? Well, editing some of the literary work. The journals have been published already, right, but okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. This is uh, Schnitzler. Some people may know Schnitzler, the Austrian modernist, who is a great diarist, yeah. So in any case, he had shown some interest in this diary conference, diaries conference idea three years ago um, and in the end it was too, he was too busy to offer a to write a proposal but he generously offered to chair a session and we're very happy to have him as a chair today it's, it's very kind Miriam and I, I do remember when the this conference was a twinkle in in your and Eve's and Alan's eyes and it's wonderful that it's come to be and I've been really enjoying what I've been able to follow um, by zoom uh, so, th so this session has two papers, and I guess it carries on some of the interests that have been been running through the the conference. Um, interests about about genre, partly, um, which for me as a kind of literary person is particularly interesting, and thinking about diaries, but also adjacent adjacent genre of various kinds, and and thinking about the material and the digital. Um, so the materiality of diaries and cognate forms, and also then the, the, their um, transformation, I guess, into digital resources of various kinds. So those, the, the two papers cover that. Our first speaker is Cherish Watton, and Cherish is doing a, a PhD on the fascinating topic of scrapbooking, of course, one of those adjacent genre, and particularly around questions of of material culture, I think, which is one of your, your great interests. But, but Cherish has also developed a website of her own, so she's also interested in, in the material and the digital and the relationship between them. Cherish. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm really thrilled to be here today um, to present on some of my research that I carried out actually back in 2018 from my MPhil, uh, which drew very heavily on the collections at Churchill Archive Centre. So it's been really interesting to kind of look back at that and reframe it through the view of the diary. On the 13th of March, 1917, Adeline Hankey read a letter. It was from her husband, Morris Hankey, who was at Downing Street attending the assembly of the Anglo-French conference. Morris wrote in a concerned tone after reading, quote, a very nasty article criticizing the extent of his involvement as part of the war council. Those his friends reassured him that the article wasn't published in a credible paper, he was still worried that he might have formed an enemy. And in the postscript to his letter, he added, we, uh, please, PS, please keep the cut in with the scrapbook. We ought to have the bad with good. And after reading the letter, Adeline followed his instructions and pasted in the article into the scrapbook. The scrapbook then was a joint endeavour that both Adeline and Morris wanted to get right. A visual demonstration of what some scholars have called a diplomatic partnership, which describes the collaborative experience of diplomatic life between husband and wife, recognising the value of both of these roles. Decades after Adeline began her first scrapbook, Stephen Roskill, scholar archivist of Churchill Archive Centre, was probably one of only a few people at that time to leaf through the scrapbook collection outside of the family. And he was drawing on that collection as part of his research for Morris's biography called Man of Secrets. So he would have seen that Adeline used newspapers, letters, and lots of other ephemeral items to chart their lives together in the period roughly between 1903 and 1943, during which time Morris began working in the Naval Intelligence Department, occupying various roles, such as a secretary to the Committee of Imperial Defense, clerk to the Privy Council, first cabinet secretary, and the first civil servant to become minister when he was given a position in Chamberlain's War Cabinet. 
We unfortunately know much less about Adeline during this time. Before compiling these scrapbooks, we know that she attended Brighton Art School in 1901 with the intent of becoming a art teacher. And it was during the second year of her course when she met Morris. He set up eyes upon her from the balcony of an opera and declared that he would, quote, marry the girl with the golden hair. And following a whirlwind romance, the two married in September 1903. And Roskill noted in his biography how Morris would have been unable to conduct his, quote, superhuman burden of work and responsibility without their complete partnership in marriage. Adeline made all of, quote, Morris's ambitions, hopes, problems and frustrations her own. Alongside this, she kept uh, all of her letters from Morris, as well as some of the most ephemeral items, such as packing lists. And included in this collection were her scrapbooks, which she appears to have compiled regularly, um, kept in a chronological order, and then reviewed at, at a later date, because we can see the use of biro pen when she has gone back and annotated them. Now, Roskill found these volumes very helpful, as I said, when writing Morris's biography, and he told Adeline so in a letter in 1967, after she gifted the scrapbooks to Churchill Archive Centre. We also know that he found the scrapbook useful because his marginalia littered some of the pages of her scrapbook, such as on this page here, where we can see two sketches, um, one by Morris and one by uh, MP Arthur Balfour on the bottom. And I don't know if you can see on the right hand side, there's a ticking off um, of material uh, which correlates with material in the biography. So Roskill's handling of this material is perhaps indicative of the gender treatment of these sources linked to the idea of the scrapbook as a book full of scraps. Uh, and also a reflection perhaps more broadly of this as a form of life writing, which draws on other people's words rather than Adeline's own. And it appears this was quite an, an isolated form of archival practice. So in this short paper, then, I want to use Adeline's scrapbook collection to explore what diary keeping looks like when it is written, not with pen, pencil or typewriter, but instead with scissors, and ask how our understanding of the diary changes when we move beyond conventional textual analysis into the realm of the material, paying attention to their visual and spatial qualities, thinking quite literally about the making of diaries. So several historians have acknowledged the material as well as the textual qualities of diaries. Jo Moran has explained how the incorporation of ephemeral material into the diary, um, as he evocatively describes it, is, shows the palpability of the traces of life. And this was a critical part of the diary keeping process. Scholars have, of scrapbooks have also understood the, the overlaps between this genre and that of diary keeping. Uh, scrapbook scholar Ellen Gruber Garvey has described scrapbooks as, quote, diaries of sorts, a form of life writing that may or may not be chronological, but records and preserve the elements of life experience and memory cues, end quote. Ronald and Mary Zabray, who work in cultural studies at Pitt University, have also drawn attention to the intriguing overlaps in an article carrying the pithy title, Is it a diary, commonplace book, scrapbook, or whatchamacallit? And while I'm not suggesting that whatchamacallit is a helpful term, I think if we have a more expansive view of diaries to include volumes which borrow the, the words of others to record events, and in this case, looking at Adeline's use of this material, we gain novel insights into the diary keeping process and what it means to keep a diary. And in this specific case, I think we gain an insight into what it looks like to record the subjective emotional experience of the diplomatic partnership. Now, unsurprisingly, Adeline dedicated a large proportion of her scrapbooks to her husband's attendance at high profile European conferences and used her scissors to offer a more subjective, informal record of these larger events. So in recording these events, she juxtaposed sort of widely circulated press photographs with more ephemeral items, such as sketches drawn by other diplomats. So as we can see here, we have um, a sketch by Morris at the top, and we have uh, a landscape that was drawn by uh, Arthur Balfour at the bottom, which Morris had since entitled Memento of Anglo-French Conference in December 1916. So here he recorded the sketch, who it was by, and keeping it for Adeline to use to record his attendance at the conference, using only items that he would have access to that she was then able to put into her own record. 
Such sketches then can be seen as a form of social recognition and validation, both within and between different groups of men in the conference, conference arena. And, it is in, and it also shows in this page that this Morris was drawing and so were other colleagues. So this was kind of a wider practice that was going on, maybe helping to while away some of the time. It was these elite homo homosocial networks and relationships which Adeline represented in her record, humanizing these large scale diplomatic events. She also incorporated signed material to demonstrate uh, marital closeness, especially when they spent a great time apart. Away in Paris, uh, four years later, Morris wrote to Adeline on the 16th of January, 1920, telling her how he had attended a private dinner with George Carpentier, a well-known French boxer. Morris gave Carpentier uh, the piece of paper, which he was going to use to write a letter to Adeline uh, and got him to sign it. At the end of the next letter that he sent to Adeline, he said, will you paste it into your book? And indeed, turning to page uh, 55 of her second scrapbook, Adeline recorded the signature of Carpentier the Boxer. Morris sent it to me from Paris, 16th of Jan, 1920, told me to put it into my book. And notice, though, so there's, you can't see it at the moment because there's the note is over the top, it's on the left hand side. But notice how it's also submerged around lots of other newspaper clippings. So it really does stand out as something a bit different in terms of this material that she's assimilating into its pages. As just Laura argues, each signature is a memorial, an act of self-declaration, and it testified to the, spe the special privileges that Hanke had um, in his position as diplomat, as well as his attentiveness to his wife in getting him getting the signature to her. And I think the later insertion of this comment over the top of the art autograph demonstrated that his acquisition was just as important as the autograph itself, highlighting the importance of the diary keeping process and in this case, highlighting the overlaps between diary, scrapbook and autograph album, which all coalesce in a single page. Now, this scrapbook collection was a joint endeavour, as we can see, and it was something that Adeline kind of recorded when she put material um, onto the pages of her book. She expended much of her energies recording Morris's life with her own endeavours, making a brief appearance. And in some ways, perhaps this shouldn't surprise us, as there is a, a tradition, particularly amongst female writers, who tend to, can tend to be quite self-effacing in their life writings, uh, exhibiting tendencies to marginalise their own perspectives and contributions. Yet the, the scrapbook, as a form of diary keeping, I think, provides a partial solution to this problem in some ways, as it allows women such as Adeline to communicate something about their lives through the spatial arrangement of material on the page. Um, so what a lot of their theories when we're working with scrapbooks draws on the kind of methodologies of scholars working in visual and photograph um, in the arenas of kind of visual and photograph albums and it pays special attention to the ways in which material is arranged on the page to kind of bring out sometimes the more subtle meanings. At the end of 1921, Adeline included a photograph published on the 28th of September in the society periodical The Tatler. Uh, and it was a photograph of herself with her children looking over a pond in their Surrey garden. And though Morris was absent in these press photographs, Adeline rectified this in her scrapbook. On the next page, Adeline inserted a postcard from Morris, had, a postcard that Morris had sent to her, um, to their daughter, Ursula, which carried a photograph of the ship that he was traveling back from Canada on. Adeline placed this postcard over the top of a second photograph published in the Tatler, and this is what you can see on the screen. In just one page then, her arrangement and the arrangement of these different types of material recorded a great deal. Her involvement in a, a photo shoot kind of showing that more conventional familial role that she was fulfilling whilst her husband was away. It shows Morris's return journey home and the importance of family that he wanted to reflect, I think, in this arrangement. The juxtaposition of this postcard with the photograph suggests that Adeline attempted metaphorically to bring Morris into the same page, using the postcard to convey his presence through his efforts to keep in touch with his family. And if we look back to the Victorian period, then Victorian mothers often use their album to record the feelings arising from separation as their children grew up. There was, as Patricia de Bello argues, an element of fantasy in these creations, giving women, quote, the power to arrange people and spaces with a degree of freedom difficult to achieve in real life, end quote. 
This same effective process then appears to have underpinned the way that Adeline compiled parts of her scrapbook and inserted herself into the pages. Adeline did not shy away then from using her agency as editor of the scrapbook diaries to offer juxtapositions which displayed the importance of having her family together. In 1967, Robin, Adeline's son, wrote to Roskill asking for the return of the first uh, item in her scrapbook collection, so the very first volume, relaying how his mother had a different and a deeper, fonder attachment with the scrapbook compared to other parts of Morris's archive. Robin noted in a letter to Roskill how, quote, she really does miss it more than anything except Pop, Morris himself, end quote. The creation of these scrapbooks was a family project and a product of their closeness and allowed Adeline to have some tactile emotional connection with her husband after he passed away. When Waskill returned the scrapbook, Adeline wrote to him to thank him, offering the clearest declarations of her feelings. Quote, my precious scrapbook has arrived today. Thanks so much for sending it. I just love having it back again, end quote. Her first scrapbook then didn't return to Churchill Archive Centre until 2002, when it was deposited with Adeline's other papers after her death. The volume then continued to have a strong emotional resonance for Adeline. To conclude then, in this paper, I've hoped to have shown the benefits of taking a wider view of what counts as a diary by looking at how the arrangement of other people's words can be just as powerful a way to mark the passage of time and reflect on one's sense of self. While these volumes have been labelled news cutting albums or scrapbooks, they share many of the qualities of more conventional diaries, such as dated entries and the chronological ordering of material. Writing with scissors then bestowed upon some diarists a level of freedom as they arranged public and private documents side by side in, Adeline case, in Adeline's case to record the diplomatic partnership. The Hanke scrapbook collection was a joint endeavour designed to primarily recall the life of Morris, but mediated quite literally through Adeline's hands. The joint collecting efforts for this collection gave the volume strong emotive power for Adeline, which resonated long after their collection. They are, as Claire Langheimer has argued, a pathway, quote, into people's affective worlds operating as an archive of feeling, end quote whether it was Adeline recording her own desires to bring her family together or mediating meetings that her husband was participating in around the world in a more informal way. And by approaching these scrapbooks uh, as a form of visual diary, the tools developed by scholars of visual media allow us to probe some of the more subtle meanings, which nonetheless represent a great deal about the recording of the diplomatic partnership. Adeline used ephemeral material to immortalize the more personal subjective perspective of her husband's work, which became a defining feature of recording their lives together. Thank you. Um, many thanks, Paul. That was very interesting, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of discussion to, to follow, to follow the next um, presentation, which is going to be beamed in from Ireland. Murphy, it's great to welcome you um, and representing, I guess, a, a duo, a collaborative partnership. Um, Rachel here as the as the historian, I guess, and um, in her absence, Kirsten Mulrennan as the the archivist primarily. And this is a very interesting example of a collaboration between those two. I mean, clearly so sort of intrinsically interdisciplinary fields. Um, and you're going to present to us, I think, some a, a kind of case study of how diaries can become digital resources through your experiences at the University of Limerick. So over to you, Rachel. That's correct. Thank you. Um, can I just check that you can see my screen there? You can. I think that's great. So thank you, Professor Weber, for your introduction there. And uh, I would also like to thank Miriam, Eve and Alan, the organisers of the conference. Um, I also would like to acknowledge my colleague, Kirsten Mulrennan, who is unable to attend today. So as a social historian focusing on the family, I have worked on a range of diaries in my research. But today, as Professor Weber said, I will be presenting on opening a window to the past, a learning resource created at the University of Limerick in Ireland. Just. 
So this image is a screenshot of the opening a window to the past homepage, which is located at specialcollections.ul.ie forward slash research hyphen diaries. This online teaching and learning tool was developed as a collaborative project between two departments at the University of Limerick, Special Collections and Archives at the Glucksman Library, which is where my colleague Dr. Kirsten Mulrennan is based, and the Department of History, where I lecture on the MA History of Family. Today, I'm going to be discussing how Kirsten and I developed this online digital resource to encourage greater engagement with Special Collections and Archives by students as a learning tool and lecturers as a teaching tool. As cognate disciplines, archives and history are very much dependent on each other. And as is the case in most universities, this is reflected in the frequent collaboration between history lecturers and archivists at the University of Limerick. The Department of History offers courses at undergraduate level, as well as four master's programmes, history, local history, history of family and public history, the last two of which are offered in online and blended format. In their first semester, undergraduates visit the archives and meet the team. They're encouraged to work with the materials held there, particularly for their final year project, a 10,000 word piece of research. Likewise, master students visit the archives early on in their first semester. A broad aim of both the history department and special collections and archives is for all students of history from first year undergraduates onwards to be familiar with our collections and how to access and use them. Collaborative teaching is therefore very important. Recent examples include videos created by the archives team for integration into online history courses and public history students writing blog posts based on our collections. Practice-based learning is a key element of many of our courses. Recently, fourth year, fourth year undergraduates in medical humanities participated in a workshop to transcribe coroner's records. And Kirsten and I have run a number of transcription workshops with students. In autumn 2019, we based a transcription exercise on one of our digitized diaries, the diary of Henry William Massey. Student feedback was positive. For instance, one student described it as, and I quote, an amazing way of getting insight into the more practical side of history. While another commented that it was a fascinating and enjoyable exercise, providing insight into both day-to-day -day life of the period in question, and into the various techniques that can be employed when working with original documents. One of our students enjoyed the activity so much that he decided to use the diary to analyze Massey's familial relationships for his master's dissertation. And I've included um, an image of the blog there and uh, the, the link to that. So having talked collaboratively on a number of modules and seen the benefits of practice-based learning for students, Kirsten and I decided to create an open online teaching and learning resource that would provide instruction on researching, reading, and understanding archival sorry, sources from the perspective of the historian. The primary audience for the resource is our history students. We envisage that history lecturers might incorporate sections of the resource in their teaching, but likewise, students could use the resource for self-guided learning or as a ref refresher before visiting the archives. Members of our secondary audience, the general public, could also use the material in a similar way. We had several guiding principles. The resource had to be open and accessible to all. The resource had to be simple to build and easily extendable, content driven rather than technology driven due to a very small budget. Software used had to be easily maintained and selected for longevity. Each lesson had to be able to stand alone while also fitting into an overall structure. The content would assume no prior knowledge and be as accessible as possible. The resource also needed to be easily managed after the project ended, so we decided to build it within the existing library website structure. We were successful in receiving funding from the 2019 Strategic Alignment Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund, which is part of the Ireland's National, teaching, um, National Forum for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. And this is managed by the University of Limerick Centre for Transformative Learning. So this is the project lining, uh, uh, sorry, the project timeline, um, and it out outlines six phases of the project. First, we agreed a structure for the resource. Next, we drafted the content. And once this was finalized in phase three, we added all the content to the website, including a game, which I'll discuss um, in more detail shortly. And then in phase four, we asked five people to test the site for us and provide us with detailed feedback. 
Phase six involved launching and marketing the resource, and phase seven related to integrating the resource within classroom teaching in a measurable way. This schema shows the structure that was agreed as part of phase one. The structure is non-linear, so users can choose their own pathway through the resource. Every page works as a standalone guide, but together the lessons provide a comprehensive overview of the key skills required for historical and archival research and a more detailed understanding of working with diaries. The lesson structure was kept deliberately simple following a similar format for most pages. Site navigation was also kept simple with a drop down table of contents and a how to cite this resource section on each page. The decision was made to use WordPress, which was already used by the library for their blog. And because of this, we selected compatible value added features such as quizzes and did you know boxes that could be added on using WordPress plugins. Each page also includes a further reading section. At this stage, we also developed a brief for a simple escape room type game with the aim of engaging a student to create it. Just as the project got started, we went into lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The project was placed on hold as we pivoted to online teaching. We heard back from the funders that the project deadline would be extended by a year. Most of those working on these projects were teachers and so time to work on additional projects like this was constrained. Over the course of the next year, we worked on the content when we had time to spare. And we also worked with a designer to agree project branding and identified the student to work on the game for us. So we were able to complete the project by May 2021. Um, which was the deadline. So I just wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the diary related content included in the online resource. As well as general information about primary sources, there is a detailed page on diaries as historical sources. It's intended to be an introduction to the subject. So the first section discusses, discusses the value of diaries to historians and covers subjects such as a brief history of diary writing and the kinds of topics that historians can research using diaries. Section two discusses how to critically analyze diaries, providing students with some of the key questions they should consider, such as who wrote the diary, why and when. Section three discusses manuscript diaries and published editions, encouraging students to think critically about the different ways in which they might access diaries. The two final sections are a quiz and further reading. The examples provided in these sections come from diaries that are written by Irish authors both in the University of Lim Limerick's collections and beyond. To help students uh, practice their paleography skills, we selected three diaries that would help, would provide them with samples of different handwriting styles, and we arranged for them to be digitized. We selected the diaries as they provided different examples of aspects of diary research. All three relate to Ireland, but they represent different time periods. They also represent different social classes and genders. In addition, each diary has a different format and style, and the author has a particular type and difficulty of handwriting. So um, there is an interactive document analysis page for each diary, and the image on this slide is a sample from Henry William Massey's diary, who I mentioned earlier. Massey was a magistrate from County Tipperary, and his diary dates from 1839 to 1842. So students can click on the highlighted areas of the image to understand more about the formatting features of the diary. So in this case, we hi highlighted the unusual um, formatting of Massey's expenses being included uh, within the main body of his diary. And that is drawn to students' attention. So each diary has a page which provides the context of the collection it belongs to and biographical information about the author. This page shows the diary of William Massey Blennerhat, sorry, Blennerhasset, a landowner and Royal Irish Constabulary sub-inspector from County Limerick. The, li um, the, uh, the diary, which covers the period 1861 to 1865, is located in the Glynn papers, which date from the 19th century and relate to the Fitzgerald family, the Knights of Glynn. And the resource also enables students to um, connect to a fully digitized version of each of the diaries, which are held in the recently launched University of Limerick Digital Library. Here you see a page from the diary of Winona Rosalie Chemist, Nee Armstrong, the author of the third diary used in the resource. Known as Jess, she was a lady of leisure from Folkestone, England and County Tipperary, Ireland, 
and her diary was written in 1914. The web page includes both general and technical metadata about diary and the digital images. Users can zoom in and out of the diary and rotate pages, and it's possible to download the diary too. The game that accompanies the learning resource is an escape room type challenge in which the user has to help the head of special collections locate a collection of diaries that have been bequeathed to the library. Users navigate their way around an old house to identify four clues which together form a code which will open a safe containing the diaries. As shown on the slide, there are four different games, each of which tests the, the student's transcription skills. We recruited a student on the BSc Computer Games Development course to work with us on this. As someone used to Java and C++ programming, his heart must have sank when we first of all asked him to create it in Google Forms to ensure it was easy for library staff to maintain. But he rose to the challenge, saying afterwards that he was incredibly happy to have engaged with this it being his first game that he had developed and released publicly. Once the team had reviewed the, the resource to a standard that we were happy with, we asked five former students to help us with user testing. The majority had completed studies to a master's level and were asked to spend two to three hours reviewing the resource. Their feedback was anonymous. The response was overwhelmingly positive, as you can see in this table. And just a couple of comments here. Um, Reviewer three commented, and I quote, Opening a window to the past is a surprise for me. Everything was very clear with just a good amount of information for definitions and explanations. And there are many further readings for those wanting more. The balance is perfect. I would have liked to have had this resource as a student. I'm sure students will appreciate and find this resource very helpful. A second reviewer commented, I found this resource extremely easy to follow and regret that it wasn't available to me while researching diaries two years ago. It is comprehensive and clear. Reviewers also provided suggestions for material they would like to be included in future extensions of the project, um, and a couple of those included maps and visual sources. Because the resource launched behind schedule, it was difficult to fully integrate it into plans for September teaching as we had hoped to do, but the resource was used by students on a number of classes, including first year art students, fourth, fourth year PE and geography students, and the MA History of Family. Feedback was again positive, um, but it should be noted that the feedback received from um, the master students was more constructive. Um, undergraduates tended just um, to, to, kick, to tick the tick box options in the survey, but not provide um, additional comments. So sorry, the next steps. So uh, next steps will be to further integrate um, the resource into our lesson planning for September 2022. So from uh, May onwards, we'll be working with lecturers to integrate this into their, um, into their modules as they uh, start planning for September. Um, we're also going to organize a marketing campaign to raise awareness of the site among the general public. Um, we are also going to be considering um, which new content could be added to the resource um, because it was always designed to be extendable. Diaries is just one um, example of a source and we hope to add more to it. Um, and then Kirsten and I are going to write up, write up a paper based on our findings once we have that measurable data from, from the students um, in, in the autumn semester. So um, I hope this whistle tops tour of opening a window to the past project has given you a flavour for the resource. Um, and uh, I look forward to taking any questions. Thank you.